want to welcome you again to this special presentation of the Landmarks of Prophecy. And today we have a study talking about bowing to the beast. And it's based upon a story that we've already touched on beginning in Daniel chapter 2. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a giant image. Remember the head was of gold. It outlines the history of the world. It gives us those landmarks of prophecy. Silver, Medo-Persia, bronze belly was Greece, the iron legs Rome, feet of iron and clay, the breakup of the Roman Empire. Nebuchadnezzar liked the part of it where it said, you are this head of gold. But he didn't like the other part of the interpretation that said, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So he came up with an idea. He thought, if that great image, that great statue that I've dreamed of represents the kingdoms of the world, if the top being gold represents Babylon, what if I make what I saw in that dream except make it all gold? And I'll tell the whole world, this is going to be the God that we worship. Babylon will last forever. He thought he could somehow change the dream by doing this. A very driven king. So that's just what he did. He made a, an image of gold and it was probably the biggest one that's ever been made in history. And then he tells everybody, gathers the who's who in his empire and they all come to the plains of Dur and he's got the whole massive orchestra there and he waits till the right moment as the sun is coming up and it's covered with a sheet and tells everybody that when we unveil this statue and you hear the music, everybody must bow down and worship. We're going to unite the empire of Babylon through common worship. Is the beast power going to try that in the last days? And so he gives a signal, the music plays, and everybody bows down. Now there was a little uh, encouragement. He said, and if you don't bow down, and whoso falls not down and worships the same hour will be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So they played the music, and almost everybody bowed down. Except there were three Hebrews. Nebuchadnezzar knew who they were. He respected them, three of his counselors, their names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Hebrew names. Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they could not bow down. Why not? One of the Ten Commandments says you will not make a graven image and bow down to it. It's very clear. And they said, we have to choose. Do we obey God or do we obey man? The Lord accomplished through those three young men that day on the plains of Dura what he had been wanting to do through the Hebrew nation for hundreds of years. He had them stand up for him among the pagans and glorify God. Nebuchadnezzar was outraged. He said, did I get it right that you wouldn't bow down? I'll tell you what, I'll give you another chance. You, maybe you didn't hear it. I don't want to lose you guys. When I play the music, we'll play it one more time. You bow down or you're going to the fiery furnace. And who's going to, what God is it that's going to save you? He knew they worshiped Jehovah. What God is going to save you from my hand? One of them answered and said, we're not going to bow down. You don't need to play the music again. But be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image that, you do, that thou hast set up. Nebuchadnezzar was in a rage and in his fury. Even as much as he loved these young men, he said, how dare you talk to me like that? I'm the king. This is a government law. He had them all tied up just as they were in their robes, strongest men in the kingdom, charged to the mouth of this furnace that was heated up seven times hotter than it should have been heated. The waves of heat were just wafting out. All three of them were thrown in the furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And his advisor said, that's true, O king. The king peering off into the furnace, he said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You may go through fiery trials when you stand up for Jesus, but the good news is you don't go alone. Just like God sent his angel to Daniel in the lion's den, Jesus will come to you during your time of trial. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Amen? Amen. Now, that same test is something we're going to face in the last days. Question number one. How does our story in Daniel relate to Revelation? We already saw this. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. As many as would not 
Worship the image of the beast should be killed. And we've got to know ahead of time what the beast is and that we're not going to compromise our convictions. It's a death decree. It doesn't get any more serious than that. Number two. Now what are the three angels' messages in Revelation 14? Very quickly, in Revelation 14 verse 7, this angel comes down from heaven. He says, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment will come or is come. Is come. Worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Now you know where you find that phrase in the Old Testament? Most of Revelation can be found in other places in the Bible. That comes from the fourth commandment. You can see it there in Exodus 20. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This is a commandment that has largely been forgotten or at least neglected by many Christians. And it may be the point of controversy in the last days. Just like you find in Daniel chapter 3. The government makes a law that says you need to break the second commandment about idolatry. And you've got to decide, do I worship God or do I break the second commandment? Daniel chapter 6. The king makes a law that says everybody must worship Darius instead of God. Daniel has to decide, do I keep the first commandment or do I obey, obey the government law? In the last days, the devil's going to take one of God's commandments. I believe it's the fourth commandment. And he's going to say, don't worry about that, even though we know what the Bible says, and tell us to change it. We're going to have to choose between obeying God and obeying men. It has to do with worship. It says the beast power will think to change times and laws. Only one commandment is both a time and a law. Revelation 14, continuing on with the second angel's message. There followed another angel saying, what is it? Babylon is fallen. Not will fall, it's happening now fall in that great city. Why? Because she, what does a woman represent in Bible analogy? So if Babylon is a woman, is it a true church or a false or counterfeit? Or compromised at least church. Because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then you come to one of the most fearful messages in the whole New Testament. Revelation 14, speaking of the third angel's message, if any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same will drink the wine of the wrath of God. So these messages warning us about we're in a time of judgment. We must return to worshiping the true God. Do not worship the beast. Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. Now you see, God has his people right now in many different churches and religions around the world. But the devil has brought all kinds of confusion. That's what Babylon is about. The Tower of Babel was confusion. Religious confusion has permeated the churches. All these different doctrines that divide us. We're going to come back on biblical unity based on truth. What does a beast represent in Bible prophecies? When I talk to you about the eagle, what country is often symbolized by the eagle? The United States. And when we say, oh, the bear, He's having problems with the eagle. Who am I talking about? And the lion. Well, several countries claim the lion, but Great Britain is... And when you say the dragon, you think China. <laughs> right? That's what they use. And so when we say Mark of the Beast, most of us are picturing some diabolical-looking, horned, hoofed monster. And when you say the U.S. is one of these beasts in prophecy, people think you're being unpatriotic. But biblically... They used beasts to identify nations. You look in Daniel 7, verse 17. These great, what? Beasts, which are four, are four what? Four monsters. No, kingdoms. So when I say that the Catholic Church and the United States are beasts, we're not calling them monsters. We're saying they are powers. They are political, religious powers. This is what the Bible says. They were kings or kingdoms. You know, friends, everyone is interested in what the Bible says about the future. And we know Bible prophecy talks about some of the ancient kingdoms like Babylon, Medo-Persia, Rome. But you might be surprised to learn the book of Revelation in chapter 13 talks very specifically about the United States of America. And we have a study guide that explains it all. We'll make it available to you for free. If you'd like to get this free resource, 
visit amazingfacts.org or call the phone number on your screen and ask for offer number 181. And once you get your free offer, make sure and read it and then share it with someone else because God's message is our mission. Daniel 7, 23, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. All right, number four. So we know what a beast is now. Now, with that as a background, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a what? A beast rise up out of the sea. Make a note, sea, because that comes up later. What does the ocean represent? Having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. This beast arises from the sea. What does sea or water symbolize biblically? You can look in Revelation 17. The angel tells John what the waters represent. The waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Meaning this power is rising up from a densely populated center of civilization. Where did the Roman church rise up from? Rome. What was the center of civilization back during that day? Who was it that imprisoned John when he had his vision? Rome. Have you heard the expression, all roads lead to Minneapolis? No, that's not how it goes. <laughs> they all lead to Rome. And be, so it was the center, and it's talking about of many peoples, many nations. And that's why Paul wanted to go preach in Rome. He ended up dying there, as did Peter. They wanted to go and get the gospel at this fountain of civilization. So that's where it would rise up from. Who gives the beast his power and his position? Revelation 13, 2, and the, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, the dragon, we know who is behind the dragon is principally devil. But in particular in Revelation 12, it's also talking about the Roman Empire ruled by the Caesars or pagan Rome. Um, when you look in Revelation 12, and we have another study that's going to go into that, it talks about this beast power, the dragon, trying to kill all the male children in Bethlehem. That's in Revelation 12. What power is it that tried to kill all the baby boys? It was Rome. Rome, you got two Romes in prophecy here. You got Rome that is iron, then you have Rome that is iron and clay. One is political, military, the other is political, military, religious. Man is made out of clay. You got one Rome led by Caesars, but then as the Caesars began to decline in their place, the church became legal, and now you have Rome led by the church, right? And so this is all it's saying is the dragon, meaning pagan Rome, ruled by Caesars, gave his seat, handed over the seat, same kingdom, same city, same palace, to the church of Rome. And so these pagans that were told, now you're Christians, they brought all their pagan beliefs into the church. One commentator from history, this is Abbott's Roman history. He said, the transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople, Constantinople named after Constantine, was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. And at the time, one might have predicted her speedy decline. But when the emperor Justinian transfer the headquarters from Rome to Constantinople. You would have thought the city of Rome is no longer the capital. It's just going to fall apart. But historians tell us the development of the church and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome or the pope gave her, Rome, a new lease on life and made her again the capital of the religious, the capital of the world this time, the religious capital of the civilized world. And we know from history that's exactly what happened. That's why it's not just called the Christian church or even the Catholic church, but it's called the Roman Catholic church. How did the headquarters of Christianity move from Jerusalem to Rome? Where was that authorized? You read in the Bible, they had their councils in Jerusalem. You remember reading that in Acts chapter 15 and other places? In the history of, from the University of Rome, it says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs or the popes in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. And so there was a transfer of authority. Didn't we just read that? It says in the Bible, he will give him his seat. The dragon gave him his seat, power, and great authority. That's that dragon power of Rome that killed Jesus, that drove the nails in his hands. How far-reaching is the influence of the beast? Well, it says he causes all 
Revelation 13 3 he makes all the world to worship and all the world wonders after the beast it tells us in Revelation 13 7 an authority was given him over every tribe tongue and nation it's a global power do you know what the word Catholic means it means universal does anyone here not know that the Roman Catholic Church is a universal not a church only but a power are you aware that the Vatican is not only a religion the Vatican is the smallest country in the world it has ambassadors it has its own money has its own railroad it's very small has its own postal system its own guard Swiss guard it is an independent country what comes out of the mouth of the beast now I tell, this is where it gets a little serious friends but we got to be honest Revelation 13 verse 6 it says he opens his mouth in what's that word blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name now you can also read about the beast power in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 it says he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God blasphemy means when a person puts themselves in the position of God now just in case you don't believe my definition this is the biblical definition if you look in John 10 33 it says that the Jews were preparing to stone Jesus they answered and said for a good work we do not stone you but for what for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God people should not be worshiped as gods that makes another God that's why Daniel would not pray to Darius but does the Catholic Church put itself in a position of making a man more than just a man this is a quote from Pope Leo the 13th we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty that's actually a painting of him as well another definition for blasphemy and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying who is this that speaks blasphemy who can forgive sins but God alone so for a man to claim the ability to forgive sins is blasphemy did Jesus say he could forgive sin he did what right did he have to do that he is the son of God now he told the woman maybe it was Mary Magdalene go and sin no more he was going to forgive her told the man let down through the roof your sins are forgiven they said that's blasphemy and they were right if he wasn't the son of God but when a man says I have the authority to decide whose sins I'm going to forgive that's defined as blasphemy now here's from the book on dignities and duties of the priests volume 12 God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon as they either refuse or give absolution the sentence of the priest proceeds and God subscribes to it it's saying the man the church decides who is forgiven where in the Bible does it say you have to confess your sins to a priest in order to be forgiven the Bible says you confess your sins to God you confess your faults to one another how long would this first beast power talking about Revelation 13 1 the first beast now how long would it be its primary rule it gives us a time period and power was given unto him to continue how long forty and two months forty two months the Jewish year had three hundred and sixty days lunar calendar forty two months was three and a half years one thousand two hundred and sixty days the legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 this is a very well established date in history when there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome the head over all the churches definer of doctrine corrector of heretics and he was given an army to force people to believe now did Jesus use an army to get believers so it started to kill people that didn't believe what the church taught church, Christian church was never told to do that and then you can read Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 under the middle military protection of Belisarius that's history of the Christian church volume 3 what happened to the beast after the 42 months you can read in Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death and the deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast well if you start with 42 months a day in a Bible prophecy is how long I have appointed you a day for a year. 42 months has 1,260 days, but that really means 1,260 years. 
if you start in 538 and you go 1260 years that comes to 1798 and so what happened in 1798 do you realize that from 538 until 1798 the Roman church had virtually uninterrupted power over Europe but in 1798 following the wars of Napoleon Napoleon sent his general Berthier into Rome he um, abolished the papal government and he established a secular one at that time the Roman church received a deadly wound they lost their sway over Europe and many of the church leaders were slain during that time the Pope himself was carried off into captivity in Valence uh, where he died now it stayed that way it looked like the church had lost its sway over Europe but the deadly wound was healed here's actually a copy of the newspaper from 1929 and this is the San Francisco Chronicle when the Pope was once again reinstated as an independent country it says the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace in affixing autographs to the memorable document healing the wound isn't that interesting language didn't we find that the deadly wound was healed healing the wound that had gone on since 1798 there was great cordiality displayed by both parties this established and Mussolini was instrumental in that you've heard of him this established the Vatican once again as an independent country that had ambassadors going not now just to the leaders of Europe but to the whole world US has an ambassador to the Vatican what does that mean that's a lot of power matter of fact Pope Francis in particular is a very unique man he's the first Jesuit Pope and to have one Pope resign Pope Benedict the 16th and then to have another Pope who comes from obscurity from another country um, from another continent who has gone to such international prominence he's in the headlines every single week and it's usually some kind of earth-shaking news the papacy has definitely gained worldwide influence prestige and prominence well, it seems like a lovely man I'm not talking about the person it just seems so kind and, and approachable and, and uh, down to earth but what we're dealing with is the teachings the official teachings have not changed you know the church they basically claim infallibility I can show you that in black and white they claim to have the ability to forgive sins what is the mysterious number that identifies the beast this is where it gets very interesting now we're getting to the end of Revelation 13 18 it says his number is what? six hundred three score and six the official title for the Pope it says it's the number of a man it means a figurehead not any one particular Pope but it's a position it's an office this is from Pope John Paul's book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope confronted with the Pope one must make a choice the leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ that title vicar of Jesus Christ in Latin is vicarious philae dei that's the position that he, that's his official title and is accepted as such by believers the Pope is considered the man who on earth represents the Son of God who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity kind of frightens me for any man to say I take the place of Jesus on earth but that's their teaching now here's a quote from a, a document that actually, actually has mysteriously gone missing what are the letters on the Pope's crown and what do they signify and it says and this was from April 18 1915 the letters on the Pope's crown are these vicarious philae dei which is Latin for vicar of the Son of God when you take that Latin title and you convert it to using Roman numerals to uh, their number equivalent you know in English our, our letters don't have numerical value but the Roman letter V represents what how many of you remember your Roman numerals I is X is 10 C 100 like century right M is millennium or a thousand so you take the Roman numerals you take the title of the Pope vicarious philae dei and you add that up and what does it come to 666 it's the number of a man his own title throughout Revelation that number 7 represents perfection or completeness the number 6 represents imperfection it's the basis for the Babylonian system of calculation a triple six therefore symbolizes a triple union of air the union of the dragon the beast and the false prophet 
The Bible is what we need to go by. Amen? The Bible says that we're not bowed down to statues, right? Catholic Church says that we can bow down and should to statues. The Bible teaches that all Christians are saints and priests. Catholic Church teaches that saints and priests are a special class within the Christian community. The Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader father, Matthew 23, 9. You know, Jesus said, call no man father. You have one father which is in heaven. Of course, the Catholic Church tells us to call priests and the Pope father. The Bible teaches to confess your sins to God only. Catholic Church says you must confess your sins to the priest for forgiveness. The teaching of purgatory, limbo, prayers for the dead are nowhere in scriptures but the relics of paganism that found their way into Christianity. And before Jesus comes, he is calling his people out of Babylon. There are good, loving, spirit-filled people in many different churches who have been confused by unbiblical teachings and God is wanting people to return to biblical truth. Tonight our subject is dealing with the uh, topic of the millennium in the Bible, sometimes known as the thousand years. You find this in Revelation 20. It's called the Devil's Dungeon. If you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to read the first few verses here and it'll give us the foundation for what we're going to study. I want to make sure everybody understands this very important subject. So if you look there in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Any question about who the devil, Satan, and dragon are? And bound him for how long? A thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. What is that? And shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, we're going to pause right there. With that as a background for our study, now we're going to get into question one of the lesson. You've got the, um, the picture, and let's learn about this dungeon that the devil is confined to. Question number one in our study. What events mark the beginning of this 1,000-year period? So how do we know? What's the landmarks that begin this time period? You find in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The second coming of Jesus is when the Lord descends and it says, and the dead in Christ rise first. Wherever you hear about first, sequentially that means what? Somewhere there's a, a second. And so it's saying blessed and holy are those that are in the first resurrection. You want to be in the first resurrection, friends. That's the resurrection of the saved. And then you read in Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. But it tells us the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Now you do not find the word millennium in the Bible. Millennium is a composite of two Latin words that simply mean milli, which is a thousand, and annum, which means years. And so the beginning of the 1,000 year period, it starts with what we call the first resurrection and the end of it is the second resurrection. There are two complete, separate, distinct resurrections. I remember when I first heard this, it kind of surprised me. I thought there was one resurrection at the end of time. The Bible's very clear. Number two, what else will happen in the first resurrection? You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 53, it says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and all the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. 
For this corruptible, it goes on to say, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Just think about that. Some people will never die. There's already a few people who have never died. Who are they? Just two. Enoch and Elijah. The Bible says Elijah, Enoch walked with God and God took him. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. There are going to be others who are alive when Jesus comes that will never experience death. So what happens? When the Lord comes down, all of a sudden we go through this miraculous, complete, total revitalization where we're transformed and we get these glorified eternal bodies and it just happens in the twinkling of an eye. That's quicker than a blink. You can read more about this answer. It's in Philippians 3, verse 21. It says, Who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. What kind of bodies do we get? Do we turn into ghosts? Or do we get glorified bodies? What was Jesus' body like when he rose from the dead? Did he tell the disciples to touch him? He was a glorious body. It was a supernatural body, but it was real at the same time. And then he said, do you have anything to eat? I'm hungry. Twice he asked them to feed him. Actually, once he did the cooking. When it was by the seashore. The other. So he's making it clear. He says, I'm not an ethereal ghost. Your glorified body is a real body. When God made Adam and Eve, did they have real bodies? Did he intend them to live forever? Does the Bible say in heaven we're going to plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them and build houses and inhabit them and we'll be doing real things. We're not just going to be strumming harps on a cloud somewhere. So our bodies will be like Jesus' glorified body. And again, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. So when the Lord comes, the dead in Christ that are dead will be caught up those who are saved will be transformed and caught up. And what happens to those left behind? Just like what happened to the devil. Consumed with the brightness of his coming. Furthermore, Revelation 16, 18, there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. This is going to be a 15 on the Richter scale because it says islands are swallowed up and the mountains are shaked out of their foundations. All right, and it goes on to say, every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a, what? A great hail out of heaven, every stone weighing about a talent. Now see that picture? That's somebody who's holding walnut-sized hail. I did an amazing fact one time to find out what was the largest hail ever recorded. In Bangladesh, they had softball-sized hail. Now that can kill you. But still, that's not 75 pounds. Can you imagine the world being pummeled by that kind of hail? Now, when all these things are happening, with the coming of Jesus, this marks the beginning of a period where Satan is bound. Revelation 20, verse 1 and 2. And an angel laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, how do you bind a devil? I mean, Samson, they tied him up with all different kinds of ropes and he just broke the ropes. You wonder, is Satan stronger than Samson? How do you tie up a devil? If we knew how, we'd all want to do it, wouldn't we? Satan is not being bound by ropes. It's the chain that's being referred to. He says the angel had a great chain in his hand. It's talking about a chain of circumstances. Now, that bottomless pit is a very interesting word and this is what throws people. It comes from a Greek word that you find other places in the Bible. You ever heard the word abyss? It comes from the Greek word abusos. Sounds similar, right? That word abusos, it means the devil is chained where he cannot do anything. It's isolation for him. The same word is used in Luke chapter 8, verse 31. You remember there's this uh, man who's possessed with a legion of demons. And the demons say to Jesus, do not cast us out into the same exact word, abusos. Demons and the devil do not want to be cast into nothingness. The devil wants to possess somebody. He will possess a serpent. The devils in this story possess pigs. They'll possess people. They want to tempt. The devil's a workaholic with nothing to do. It's torture for him. And so the bottomless pit is this planet 
For 1,000 years, Satan is going to be bound down here in darkness with his demons, with no humans alive. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, what direction do the dead in Christ go? Oh, the living saints are transformed, and what direction do they go? We will be caught up. Remember, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be. So we're all going back to the mansions he's prepared when he comes, right? What happens to the wicked who are alive when he comes? The devil and uh, all the devil's going to run from his presence. All the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. How many people are alive on the planet at that point? Nobody. Who does the devil have to tempt? Him and his demons. They're going to be chained on this dark planet. Question number three. In what condition will the earth be left after this devastating earthquake and hailstorm that begin the 1,000 years? Let's let the Bible explain itself. Isaiah 24, verse 19. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turneth it upside down. The earth is utterly broken down. How many people are on the earth? It's empty. Read now in Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, and... Boy, now you read that, you might think, oh, he's talking about creation. Because it's the same wording, but it's not what he's talking about. Keep reading. I beheld in the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And there was no man... All the birds of heaven were fled. The fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. What was the condition of Israel after Nebuchadnezzar came and left? Desolate, cities broken down. Didn't we just read that? Read Jeremiah 25, verse 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Is that clear? They shall not be lamented, neither ga gathered nor buried. Why is there nobody to gather them or to bury them? Because there's nobody alive. Now, I'll tell you why this is such an important subject. I need both hands. I've got to put down my clicker for this. Many dear Christians believe the Tim LaHaye left behind scenario of final events, which say, and again, we may just respectfully disagree, but they say that the secret rapture takes place seven years before Jesus actually touches the earth. They go back to heaven, great tribulation, people still alive on earth during the tribulation. Then at the end of that time, Jesus comes down and the millennial reign is here on earth and then at the end of that millennial reign, the wicked are slain, and we just occupy the earth. In that scenario, where is the earth completely vacated from all life? It doesn't fit. It never happens. It, it doesn't fit the scheme in the Bible of what it's describing. And so this is what Protestants used to believe for about 1,500 years, and it's getting eclipsed by Hollywood productions now tells us that the slain of the Lord covered the earth. There is no man. I turn the earth upside down. It's utterly empty. The cities are all broken down. They've all fled from the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. There's no one to lament or bury them or mourn. They're all gone. But we're living and reigning with Christ. Satan is bound on this planet. You know, in the, um, the Greek Old Testament, uh, it's the same Old Testament as Hebrew, except it's in Greek, called the Septuagint, when it says the earth is void, it uses the word abusos. It calls this planet the same thing. And that verse in Jeremiah uses the word abusos. The earth is an, was an abyss. Satan is bound on this planet with nobody to tempt and manipulate. And he has to look at the consequences of his rebellion for 1,000 years. That's a long prison sentence. All right, number four. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years and what will they be doing? All right, now we're going to jump to heaven. It's going to be a prettier picture. John 14, verse 3, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you might be also. 
He's taking us to where he is, where he's told his disciples he was going. Is it clear we're going up? Yet the left behind scenario says that we spend the millennium here on earth reigning over the wicked. I don't know about you, but I have no aspirations to reign over the wicked. Uh, that would be really strange. Think about that, that the righteous are here on earth, they've got glorified bodies, and they're reigning over the wicked that still marry, have babies, and die. It just, it, it just seems uh, really strange to make that fit. Revelation 20, verse 4. What are we doing in heaven when it says we live and reign with Christ? It tells us in the Bible. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now what does judgment mean? Does that mean that we're up there going, innocent, guilty, innocent, guilty? Who are we judging? Keep reading. It tells us. 1 Corinthians, this is Paul, chapter 6, verse 2. Do you not know, and verse 3, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? You know, we're, as Christians, going to be persecuted by the world. We're going to be judged. There'll be a death decree on us. But before that happens, Jesus is going to come and rescue us, and the tables are going to turn. That means Paul will someday be sitting in judgment of Nero, who declared that Paul should be beheaded. Won't that be interesting? So God is just. All right, question number five. What will happen at the close of the 1,000 years? Several things. Behold, it says, and now I'm in Zechariah 14, verse 1, 4, 5, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And it says, the Mount of Olives will cleave in the midst thereof. The night we studied the second coming, if anybody comes along and they say, I'm Jesus, if his feet are touching the ground, he's not Jesus, because when Jesus' feet touch the ground, he's coming to the Mount of Olives and it's going to split and form a great valley. Now why does that happen? Revelation 21, verse 2, it's in your lesson. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is a great marriage supper where finally the end of that 7,000 year period takes place. This all happens at the end of that 1,000 years. The new Jerusalem comes down. That is the good Jerusalem, city of peace. All right, so when that happens, what happens next to now free Satan from his prison? You read in um, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, we already touched on this, but we're going to read it again. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. What does that imply? After the thousand years are finished, what happens? They live again. You know what else we read? After the thousand years are finished, Satan is loose from his prison. What is it that looses Satan from his prison? All the wicked dead who have ever lived are going to come back to life. He's now got this vast army again that's always listened to him before. They're ready and able to listen to him again. So, what will Satan do when the wicked are raised? Revelation 20, verse 8 and 9, it says, He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and it goes on to say, they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city. Ezekiel talks about Gog and Magog coming against the people of God. Gog and Magog, you read in Genesis, they are some of the ancestors of the tribes that fought against Israel. They represent the enemies of Israel. Gog, Magog means from the matrix or the children of Gog. Gog was a warlike nation that fought against Israel. Magog meant and the children of Gog. So I've heard people say, oh, it's Russia and China. And Revelation is not talking about those kind of battles of nations. It's talking about the battle between good and evil, Christ and Satan, those who follow him and those who don't. Revelation, it talks about Babylon, the mother of harlots and her daughters, Gog and Magog. You've got the wicked and their children, it talks about, and that's all that's saying. 
They, it says, they cover the earth like a cloud. Can you imagine just the swarms of humanity all over the planet? And those in the city, it's going to look pretty ominous for us. Number six, at this crucial moment, what will stop everything? Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Who are the dead that are being judged at this judgment? That's the wicked. They're dead spiritually. Jesus said, if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you do not have life. And so during that time when they prepared to launch this assault on the city of God, Jesus is exalted above the city. This battle is paused. The Lord will make every person's life to pass before them. In the heavens where all can see above the new Jerusalem, they'll see Jesus coming into the world. They'll see his perfect life. They'll see that he taught everybody what they need to do to be saved. They'll see Jesus' sufferings at the hands of Lucifer and the way that the devil was so filled with his love for power and Jesus was so filled with the power of love. What will happen next? After God shows the issues, shows people their sins, shows his goodness, everyone bows down and they say, Jesus is Lord. Even the devil will finally be constrained by the justice of God to bow down and declare that Jesus is Lord. It'll be harder for him than anyone. And at that point, the devil jumps back to his feet and he said, it's our last chance. Take the city. They come against the city of God. It tells us in Revelation 20 verse 9, at that point, God has no alternative, does he? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Again, Revelation 20 verse 15, and it tells us, whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. As that fire rains down around the New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem's got big walls. It's safe. Even though it's molten outside the city, everyone inside is safe. And all the wicked are going to be punished according to what they deserve. And anyone not found in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible says this is the second death. So quickly, and that's by the way, Revelation 20 verse 14. Let's review what happens now uh, to mark out the millennium. We'll just put a little chart up on the screen to give you the quick picture of how do you separate this period of time. At the beginning of the 1,000 years, you have the first resurrection and the second coming, right? And then at the end, it's the second resurrection and the holy city comes down. During the 1,000 years, the righteous are in heaven. We're looking at the books. We're asking questions. We're judging so that when the judgment happens, we are all in agreement saying true and righteous are his judgments. And then after the 1,000 years, fire comes down. There, it's called the executive part of the judgment when people receive their penalties. After the fire goes out, what will God do for his people at that time? Do we continue treading on ashes? Or does the Bible say, Isaiah 66, 17, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. We will get to see him making this new heaven and this new earth. Amen? Won't that be exciting? And then read also Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And the Lord wants you in that city, friends. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. But we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. We will get to watch Jesus making the world all over again even more beautiful than before because he's going to give us an upgrade. God himself will dwell with us. Amen? Where will God and the righteous finally live? Revelation 21 verse 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. God is going to live with us. Instead of this just being another world, the Lord is moving the capital of the universe to this planet and that's why we will reign with Christ. Won't that be wonderful, friends? Amen. At this point, all of this is, is behind us. The meek will inherit the earth. The question is, where will we be? 
the Lord has brought you to these meetings. You're watching now, you're here now because he wants you to accept his gift of everlasting life that he's offering. He has a special plan for your life that he can only mobilize and activate when he returns and when you surrender your life to him. He can, begins now. Would you like to make that decision tonight, friends? You can have that. We don't have to fear all the pain and the darkness in this world if we give our lives to Jesus.